The man known to history as Jefferson Finnis Davis was born near Fairview in the state of Kentucky on the 3rd of June, 1808. He was christened Jefferson in reference to the third President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, for whom his parents had great respect. His father was Samuel Emery Davis, whose family had come originally from Wales to the British colonies and had traveled to Georgia from Philadelphia. Samuel, born in 1755 or 1758, joined the American revolutionaries and fought against the British Army during the War of American Independence. Joining several of his half-brothers, he spent most of his time with South Carolinian regiments and was wounded twice during the war. Samuel received a large land grant in Georgia for his service during the war and was appointed a clerk of the courts, a prestigious local position. Jefferson's mother was Jane Cook, who Samuel had met in South Carolina during the war. Little is known of her life, some stating she was the daughter of Baptist minister William Cook, while other accounts state she was the daughter of Irish immigrant Roger Cook. The couple were married shortly after the end of the war and settled in Georgia. She gave birth to her first son, Joseph Emery Davis, in 1784 and would have ten children during her lifetime. The Davises remained in Georgia until 1797, when they moved to what is now Fairview, Kentucky. The year Jefferson Davis was born, his namesake, Thomas Jefferson, was ending his final year in office. His successor, James Madison, one of the leaders of the Jeffersonian Republican Party and one of the architects of the U.S. Constitution, had recently been elected. The United States was rapidly developing and expanding westward, particularly following the collapse of French efforts to renew their North American empire following the disastrous defeat against the Haitian forces in 1804. Napoleon Bonaparte had sold his North American lands to Thomas Jefferson in what has become known as the Louisiana Purchase, thus dramatically expanding the young republic's geographical holdings to the Rocky Mountains. The original 13 states had been joined by four others west of the Appalachian Mountains and territories, with American governments forming across the western frontiers of the republic. As had been the case since the American Revolution, the topic of slavery and its future in the republic remained a hot-button issue. Slavery was well established in the U.S. by the time of Davis's birth and had been a feature of the American economy for almost two centuries. Repeatedly, Congress had debated the expansion of slavery into Western territories, with both Northern and Southern statesmen opposing the expansion of the peculiar institution. The abolition of slavery was already taking shape in the northern half of the United States, with many states adopting gradual emancipation laws and others, such as Massachusetts, legally ending slavery immediately. The United States also in 1808 abolished the African slave trade, and for many people in the United States, it seemed that slavery was gradually headed towards extinction. However, while abolitionism was gaining ground, so too were pro-slavery arguments. The Haitian Revolution, which was the first large-scale slave revolt that had resulted in an independent black nation, had deeply troubled many people in the Atlantic world, in part because of the extreme violence that had been enacted by both sides during the revolution. Pro-slavery writers looked to build upon people's fears of slave revolts and argued that not only was slavery an essential part of the southern economy, but it also was necessary to preserve the safety of the nation. However, much to the chagrin of pro-slavery advocates, they struggled to gain dominance over abolitionism, 
setting the stage for decades of heated conflict. Jefferson Davis's family would have been well aware of these debates. Kentucky had a small but vocal group of abolitionists who had advocated abolishing slavery in the 1792 Kentucky Constitutional Convention. Furthermore, the Davises, like many Southerners, were looking towards the West for greater profits. Expansion to the West was connected deeply to Native American expulsion and the expansion of slavery. Samuel Davis and his family moved westward and established a plantation in southwestern Mississippi two years after Jefferson Davis was born, named Rosemont. While slavery was certainly a hot topic in the early Republic, other issues, such as how to organize the Republic's electoral politics, how to run the economy, and how to interact with foreign powers were all filling the national discourse. Many foreign visitors were shocked by how rapid the growth of the young republic was. While many Europeans looked down on Americans for their roughness and lack of refinement, others marveled at the growing strength of the republic. While many Americans worried that the republic was under threat from European superpowers, a sense of confidence and optimism was increasingly felt by many Americans that their nation would rise to be a self-sufficient and powerful state. Jefferson certainly took in all this optimism and flurry of ideas that demanded the United States focus on becoming a power in the Americas. Jefferson was the youngest child in his family and received the doting attention of his parents and siblings. His elder brother was a lawyer and owned his own plantation and rising in Southern society. Jefferson's father was keen that his youngest son be taught the ways of the Southern gentleman, which he saw as being founded on honor, courtesy, and hospitality. These views were held concurrently with a complex racial ideology, which held black people to be an inferior species over whom white planters had a right of ownership. In order to further the sophistication of his son, Samuel sent Jefferson to St. Thomas Aquinas College in Kentucky, which disquieted Jane, who was concerned about her son being sent to study so far away, and who was worried that the Baptist doctrines held by the family would clash with those of the Catholic school to which he was being sent. It was on his way to the school with his father in 1816, that the eight-year-old Jefferson Davis was introduced to Andrew Jackson, the general who had defeated the British at the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812, and who was considered by many to be the true successor of Thomas Jefferson when they traveled through Nashville, Tennessee. The visit left a great impression on Davis. Davis studied in Kentucky for two years, after which he returned home and studied in local schools for a further five, during which time he gained a reputation as a mischief maker and a decent student, albeit one without much inclination towards study. During this period, a considerable and fierce debate raged over the status of lands west of the Mississippi River and the expansion of slavery, particularly during Congress in 1819 and 1820 the push of the Northern abolitionist congressmen to halt the spread of slavery infuriated many Southerners, and rumors began to circulate of a civil war. Averting this disaster, a political compromise known as the Missouri Compromise proposed that in order for a new slave state to join the Union, a free state thus had to be admitted thus preserving the congressional balance of power between slave and free states. Furthermore, it defined the 36th parallel as the boundary between slave states and free states, with slave states only being permitted south of the line. Though an uneasy compromise had been achieved, many across the nation were frustrated at the outcome of the compromise. Northern abolition societies grew, as did the vocal defenders of slavery. 
Though it appeared a pro-slavery consensus had been achieved, the reality was that neither side had given ground ideologically, a fact that would shape the conflicts of the next several decades. In 1823, at age 15, Davis returned to Kentucky to study at Transylvania University, which was then one of the most highly regarded schools in the South. During his time at university, Davis came to realize that he had a talent for debating and became engaged in the school's political and social life, meeting with the sons of influential Southern families. However, after his first year at university, Jefferson was greeted with the unwelcome news that his father had been bankrupted and forced to sell Rosemont. Shortly after he had received this information, he was informed that his father had contracted malaria and died. With Samuel gone, Jefferson's older brother Joseph assumed the role of the head of the Davis family and bought back Rosemont, a fact which brought Jefferson joy. However, he was soon informed that his family had arranged for him to attend the United States Military Academy at West Point, which perturbed him. Jefferson had intended to follow his brother into law and professed that he had little interest in the military. The South had a strong connection to West Point, and Southerners outnumbered their Northern counterparts in the school where Davis matriculated alongside other promising cadets, such as Robert E. Lee. However, unlike some of his classmates, Davis did not fit well with the West Point model. He was often reprimanded for his sloppy dress and lack of punctuality, and was punished for several offenses, including firing his rifle out of a bedroom window, spitting, and intoxication, and he was threatened at least twice with expulsion. Somehow, Davis managed to remain in the academy, and he eventually gravitated towards military science, and accepted the prospect that he would serve as a junior army officer for a few years after he graduated. Davis left West Point in June 1828 and returned home to Mississippi before transferring to Missouri, now a slave state and the hub of military and economic expansion towards the West, to serve as a second lieutenant. Davis cut a dashing figure to the young women of St. Louis and was very popular, yet he was soon transferred again, this time to Fort Winnebago on the Wisconsin River in what was then Michigan Territory. Davis was constantly sick and considered the region dull. Davis spent his time overseeing the management of an army base and the construction of a sawmill, and in the winter of 1830 to 1831, Davis caught pneumonia and was nursed back to health by his enslaved servant, Jim Pemberton. After this interlude, Davis was posted to Galena, Illinois, where he mediated a conflict which had developed between settlers and Native Americans. Davis cared little for the indigenous population and generally regarded them as inferior and savage, as was typical of many Westerners. Davis generally favored settler communities whenever he had the chance. Davis remained in the region until 1832, before he asked for leave to return home. Whilst he was in Mississippi, tensions between Native American and settler communities in Illinois had reached a breaking point and erupted into what became known as the Black Hawk War, named for the chief who led the Native resistance. Davis missed the fighting, but returned to Illinois in time to be posted as a commander in Black Hawk's guard duty when he was transferred from Fort Crawford to St. Louis. By 1833, Davis remained at the lowly rank of second lieutenant despite having served as an officer for five years. This lack of recognition and excitement led Davis to frustrated insubordination. He was eventually promoted to first lieutenant of cavalry, but his attitude remained the same, and he was later court-martialed for being disrespectful to his commanding officer, Major R.B. Mason. Jefferson put his debating skills to work as he was able to successfully defend himself by arguing that Mason 
had disrespected his honor first. It was during this period that Davis caught the eye of Sarah Knox Taylor, the daughter of Colonel Zachary Taylor, his commander at Fort Winnebago and later President of the United States. The two exchanged love letters for three years before Davis proposed to her in 1835, which was reluctantly agreed to by his commander, who had only a few years earlier denied Davis's request. Jefferson resigned his commission and married Taylor at a ceremony in Kentucky. Davis had, by this time, begun building up his status by purchasing enslaved African Americans and obtaining 800 acres from his brother Joseph, where he founded his own plantation called Briarfield Plantation. However, tragedy struck when only a few days after going to Louisiana for their honeymoon, the young couple became sick with malaria. Davis recovered. However, his young bride continued to struggle until her death on September the 15th, 1835. Davis was devastated at the loss of his wife and returned to his brother's plantation to recover. He threw himself into building his plantation, expanding the cotton production of his land with the labor of his enslaved servants. During this time, Davis took a short trip to Cuba and then spent time in Washington, D.C., where he attended sessions of Congress, which was in full swing. Davis listened to the lively debate surrounding how involved the United States should become in the revolt of American settlers in the Mexican province of Texas. In April 1836, Texan rebels had routed the Mexican army at the Battle of San Jacinto, and there was a debate as to whether the territory should be admitted to the United States. Southerners overwhelmingly supported the move, but many in the North were concerned about admitting such a large slave state to the Union. He likely listened to men such as John Calhoun from South Carolina, who had increasingly threatened to lead his home state out of the Union, a policy which enraged the then President Andrew Jackson, who rejected the idea of secession. Davis had no personal quarrel with the idea of slavery and maintained a belief that militias were required in order to keep slaves in order and to prevent rebellion. However, whilst a defender of slavery and the ideology of white supremacy, Davis disagreed with some fellow landowners in their approach to treating slaves as animals who could be subject to pure physical coercion. He allowed his slaves to use his guns to go hunting and to help themselves to his corn supply and provided decent health care in the event of injury or illness. While expanding his own cotton plantation, Davis watched the development of national politics with keen interest, and soon found an outlet for his general boredom by entering the political arena. The two dominant parties of the era, the Whigs and the Democrats, both had broad national appeal. The Whigs were generally favored by the Southern elite, although Davis ended up backing the Democrats, the party of Andrew Jackson and Thomas Jefferson. The Democrats were generally favored by smaller plantation owners, although they were the underdog party in Davis's district. Davis found that he was a natural politician and was soon put up by the Democrats in large debates for state offices. This was the era of stump speeches and rowdy party meetings. Supporters and opponents flocked to public speeches as candidates took American democracy directly to the voters. Davis excelled in this environment as a public speaker, and in 1843, he made a run for the Mississippi legislature, narrowly losing out to a Whig contender, but captured the attention of state Democrats with his spirited campaign. As a result, he was chosen in 1844 to be one of the state's presidential electors for James Polk, for whom Davis rallied during his presidential campaign, even though he had initially supported John Calhoun and made a name for himself in conducting a lecture circuit in which he attacked the Whigs with barbed remarks. It was during this time 
that he made his own political views clear, stating his support for the annexation of Texas, the end of tariffs which harmed the southern economy, as well as the annexation of Oregon Territory, placing his support firmly with those who backed Manifest Destiny and the expansion of the United States. In 1844, Davis became engaged to Varina Howell, a native of Natchez, Mississippi. Davis had removed himself from much of the romantic scene since the death of his wife, but he had fallen in love with Howell, who had an extensive knowledge of politics and literature. The two were married a year later in 1845 and honeymooned in New Orleans, and in late 1845, Polk was elected president and Davis, as his spokesman in the South, gained considerable political influence as a result. With this high level of political backing, Davis decided to run for Congress and was duly elected to the House of Representatives. He arrived in Washington three weeks after he learned of his victory and set about garnering support for the annexation of the Oregon Territory, which he believed to be of vital importance for the health and safety of the United States. Davis also advocated for policies which backed a Jeffersonian interpretation of the Constitution, such as the clear division of power and shared responsibilities between federal and state governments. Davis's time in Congress was cut short when, in March 1846, tensions between the US and Mexican governments reached a breaking point. When US troops occupied the Rio Grande, which was claimed by Mexico, and on the 11th of May, 1846, Polk convinced Congress to pass a declaration of war against Mexico on the basis of a small border infringement. Davis once again joined the army so that he could fight for the United States. He resigned his seat in Congress and assumed command of the 1st Mississippi Rifles Infantry with the rank of Colonel. Davis outfitted and armed his soldiers at his own expense and sailed for Texas to fight under the command of Zachary Taylor, his former father-in-law. Taylor, known as Old Rough and Ready, was a gifted general, and Davis found him a fair and effective commanding officer. In September, Davis's regiment was sent to besiege the town of Monterey, and after an assault which lasted a week, the fortified town fell. However, this victory led to several negative events. Taylor, a popular general, was seen as a political threat to Polk, who, in an effort to hamstring Taylor's military capabilities, directed troops away from his command and toward General Winfield Scott, supposedly as a precursor to an assault on Mexico City. Santa Ana, a Mexican general, learned of Taylor's weakness and attacked his forces in February 1847, a battle during which Davis was shot in the foot. This engagement in the mountain pass of Buena Vista was to become one of Davis's finest moments despite his injury. During the battle, he pushed his men forward and halted the Mexican advance, turning the tide in favor of the Americans and, by the end of the 22nd of February 1847, Taylor had defeated the Mexican assault. Davis was hailed as the hero of Buena Vista, and he was sent home soon after as a result of his injury. Once home, Davis observed the events unfolding in Mexico from afar, unable to militarily affect the outcome of the war. Davis wished for the expansion of the US into the entire area of Mexico, and his wish was granted in part when the Mexican government capitulated in early 1848, handing the US California and its other northern territories. This acquisition occurred alongside the signing of a treaty with Britain, which handed the US control of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Collectively, these events expanded the land area of the US by more than a half. The expansion pleased expansionists such as Davis, but inflamed the debate over slavery, which was now questioned in relation to these new states. In December 1847, Davis returned to Congress. 
this time on crutches, where he was hailed as a national hero and took up the vacant seat for Mississippi in the Senate. The intensity of the debate around slavery heightened rapidly after this period, characterized with the introduction of the Wilmot Proviso, sponsored by David Wilmot, which attempted to prevent any expansion of slavery to the new, formerly Mexican, territories. Davis, along with many other Southerners, viewed this as a definitive attempt by Northern politicians to control the South, which increased the war footing that Southern politicians adopted. The question of California was also incendiary, and it was feared that if the territory, recently populated owing to the gold rush, would enter into the Union as a free state, that this would give the advantage to free states in Congress. The tempo of these debates soon reached fever pitch, and fistfights began to break out between representatives in Congress. Whilst Southern politicians increasingly mentioned, and then threatened, secession from the United States. Davis adopted a position which sought to keep the South in the US, but to sustain its slave economy, he argued that the South should have a fair share of slave states in the new territories of the West. While supporting the South remaining in the United States, Davis also broke from his political hero, Andrew Jackson, in declaring that the South had the right to cede from the Union. This explosive view rested on the belief that the federal government had overstepped its bestowed authority by attempting to enforce anti-slavery policies both in the South and in the wider congressional settlement. In short, Davis argued that the North had no right to use the federal government to tell Southerners what to do with their property, which, in his view, included the people they kept as slaves. Many Northerners who espoused the concept of free labor, a political belief system that held that free labor, or people working for pay, was far superior to enslaved labor. Built upon ideas that have been advocated since before the American Revolution by men such as Benjamin Franklin, free labor ideology insisted that slavery was unproductive and also immoral. It harmed white people and degraded men into a state of savagery. However, free labor aided nations and people in becoming virtuous and increased economic output. Equally committed to American expansion, free labor advocates believed that it was essential that lands be kept out of the hands of slaveholders and instead given to individual citizens to work as small farms. Expansion West was a safety valve to the increasing population and wretched living conditions in the North's inner cities. More and more Northerners were becoming convinced that not only was slavery degrading, but it was an active threat to the progress of free labor, particularly as Davis and his fellow Southerners advocated for the expansion of slavery. Davis was at the center of two competing visions of American empire, one being based in free labor and the other on slavery. Davis, a vocal and feisty advocate for slavery, was consistent in his push to turn America towards an increasingly pro-slavery policy. The deepening divide between the two camps concerned many Americans, including Davis's former father-in-law, Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor had, by 1849, become president and was deeply concerned by talk of secession. Other politicians, such as Henry Clay, attempted to bring about a settlement with the Compromise of 1850, which suggested that California be admitted as a free state, with other new states admitted on the basis of their own decision. Resolutions passed at the same time that a call for the abolition of slavery in Washington, D.C., where it was still legal, was presented. The Compromise was deeply unpopular across the country. It divided the two sides between their moderate and extreme wings. Moderates on both sides hailed the proposal as a way of avoiding conflict and division, whereas hardliners argued either that the proposal was too restrictive on slavery or not restrictive enough. 
Davis, joining other irate Southerners such as John C. Calhoun, himself argued that the bill did not protect the rights of the South adequately and felt that the compromise did not define and guarantee the rights of slave states on the question of admitting new Western states. Politicians such as Henry Clay and Stephen A. Douglas, the key organizers of the compromise, defended the concept. While many Southerners were in fact in favor of a compromise, there was still enough political capital to continue to support hardliners such as Jefferson Davis in pushing back against the compromise. In the autumn of 1851, Davis was informed that the Democratic candidate for governor of Mississippi, John Quitman, had resigned from the race. Davis was invited to take up the mantle and returned to Mississippi to fight for the seat. He narrowly lost the race and returned to his plantation, adamant that he would remain out of politics until the people of Mississippi came to back his point of view. In 1852, Davis and Varina had their first child, whom they named Samuel. The pair would go on to have five other children, three boys and two girls. However, only his female children lived beyond the age of 21. As his family grew, Davis found himself returning to the world of politics as he engaged in campaigning for Franklin Pierce, who was successfully elected president, leading Davis to be offered a position in the cabinet as the Secretary of War as a reward for his loyalty and efforts. Davis took his position in 1853. The happiness that Davis felt at this newfound political success was undone by the death of his son, Samuel, in 1854. Davis remained inconsolable for many months after his son's death, yet Despite this tragedy, he remained a highly competent leader and the War Department was well managed. He helped lead the War Department through a series of new innovations, including the formation of the Army Medical Corps, new cavalry and fortress building tactics, as well as shipping camels over from North Africa to act as pack animals in the new Southwestern Territories. Davis also extended his reach into other areas of governmental administration and oversaw the construction of a new dome and wings to the Capitol building, and even attempted to plan and map out a new transcontinental railroad, one that ran through the South, of course, and perhaps one of his most ambitious failed ventures was an attempt to get the Spanish government to sell the island of Cuba to the US which he hoped would be entered into the Union as a slave state. Davis was vigorous in his vision of building the American Republic, following closely in Thomas Jefferson's vision of an American empire of liberty, that is an empire that prioritized the liberty of those of European descent. Rather than just be an empire confined to the North American continent, Davis and others viewed the American empire expanding southward, incorporating the Caribbean, Central, and South America. With these expansions, slavery would progress as well. In 1854, Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas proposed that the populations of Kansas and Nebraska decide for themselves whether they would be slave or free states through the medium of a popular vote. Almost immediately, large groups of free labor and pro-slavery advocates crossed the borderlines into Kansas and Nebraska territory. Hostilities quickly escalated into violence and vigilantism, with large groups of Missourians also crossing the border to inflame the tensions in what was soon to be known as Bleeding Kansas. The conflict shattered the Whig Party and gave birth to a new party, the Republican Party. The free labor anti-slavery movement played a crucial role in the formation of the Republican Party, which became the most popular anti-slavery party. Republicanism's popularity further surged with the events of Bleeding Kansas, the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, 
and the integration of many smaller northern parties. The Republicans soon became a strong opponent of the Democrats, who maintained the support of the South and advocated in favor of slavery or, at a minimum, a continuation of the status quo. Davis watched these developments with concern, particularly the rise of a popular anti-slavery party. He had ended a speech in 1848 warning against the unholy prospect of a civil war, and it seemed ever closer. Davis was re-elected to the Senate, which was done through the state's legislature in 1856 after the Democratic nomination went to James Buchanan. Davis resumed his seat as a senator and began a grand tour of the state to better learn the will of his constituents, particularly if they would back a war against the North. Davis was certain and publicly maintained that it was the North antagonizing the South and that slavery was an institution upon which the region depended. While Davis and other Southern leaders continued to push for an expansion of slavery, the national harmony frayed even further following the Dred Scott decision in the Supreme Court. The case revolved around an enslaved man named Dred Scott who had sued for his freedom after being held in bondage in a free northern state. The judicial ruling, which sided with the defense, argued in the majority opinion of Chief Justice Roger Taney that black men had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, thereby declaring, in other words, that Congress had no right to impose limits on slavery and that it could spread beyond the boundaries imposed by state and federal legislatures. Even more inflammatory than the Missouri Compromise, the nation seemed near the point of disillusion. Pro-slavery advocates celebrated the ruling, while northern populaces became more firmly entrenched in free labor ideology and anti-slavery beliefs. Furthermore, northerners saw this as a direct attack upon their way of life as it perhaps opened the introduction of slavery into states that had legally barred the institution. Both sides threatened violence in the aftermath of the ruling. Davis returned to the Senate ready to attack his fellow Senate colleagues from the North, but found that they had rallied after the outcome of the case and proclaimed in even stronger terms the evil of slavery and their desire to abolish it. For Davis, the North had lost their minds. President Buchanan tried his best to keep the nation together, but struggled under the weight of the two factions which had become ever more divided since the ruling on Dred Scott's case. This division affected Congress, who began to heatedly and sometimes violently debate the matter at hand. In one instance, a congressman from South Carolina beat Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner with a heavy cane so badly that he was incapacitated for the following three years. While some have argued that slavery was in decline and vastly unpopular in the Atlantic world or the regions touching the Atlantic Ocean, in fact, slavery had begun to have a resurgence in popularity. In part, spurred by the tremendous economic success of the South, as well as pro-slavery propaganda, which relied on racialized arguments to justify the enslavement of people of color, slavery was never stronger. Even in anti-slavery hotbeds like Great Britain, certain cities, such as Liverpool, had rallied around the South's cause. Davis and his contemporaries sensed this change and pushed hard to seize the advantage in this to-the-death struggle with free labor ideology. As Northerners hardened their stances against the South, Davis and his fellow hardliners urged a boycott of the North and its products, thus shifting capital back to the South. The strain of the conflict took a toll on Davis, and he began to suffer severe health problems. By the winter of 1857, he had lost sight in one eye and was emaciated, his doctor demanding that he step back from politics in order to recover. 
Davis did so in 1857, traveling with his family, hypocritically, to a resort in the North. Davis returned to Congress in late 1858 and focused his energies on drawing up plans for the expansion of the South into Cuba and engaging in ferocious conflict with Northern Democrats such as Stephen Douglas. In October 1859, events came to a head when the abolitionist John Brown attacked a federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry in Virginia in an attempt to incite a slave insurrection after which he was tried and executed for treason. Many Southern politicians were outraged at Brown's raid and saw it as a demonstration of the willingness of abolitionists to engage in violence in order to promote their views, forgetting that they too had engaged in violence to expand slavery. Davis, ensconced in Washington, struggled to assess the views of his voters in the South. Did they back an escalation of force with the North? Davis pondered this question, but drifted ever closer to the Southern radicals in Congress, and in April 1860, the Southern Democrats met in Charleston, South Carolina, in order to elect a new presidential candidate. Davis knew that he had widespread support in the South, but understood that he was a controversial figure and unlikely to win much support in the North as a result. He therefore made no effort to seek the nomination. The Democratic Convention was left divided between two candidates. Northern politicians broadly supported Stephen Douglas and Southern Democrats backed John C. Beckinridge. A few weeks later, Abraham Lincoln secured the nomination for the Republican presidential candidate on the promise that he would end the spread of slavery, though not to abolish it. The election that followed was a disaster for the Democrats. Seriously divided between two polarizing candidates, Abraham Lincoln was able to defeat their challenge with ease by providing a stable reassurance that he would end the spread of slavery a sentiment which rallied and united much of the North, Lincoln made clear from the outset of his presidency that he had no ambition to abolish slavery, rather to stem its spread. This was a statement designed in part to appease the South, which remained suspicious and continued to debate secession from the Union. Lincoln won the presidency without a single Southern electoral vote first time in the nation's history. Many Southerners believed this signaled the end of the South's dominance of the presidency. South Carolina on the 20th of December 1860 declared formally that it was leaving the United States, closely followed by Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. Virginia and the northern Southern states hesitated desperate for some sort of compromise to emerge. When he learned that Mississippi had ceded from the Union, Davis left Congress and gave a farewell address on the 21st of January 1861. He called for all Southern states to cede and argued that they had been driven to this course of action as a result of the aggression and intransigence of the North. On the 8th of February 1861, the ceded states issued a declaration which proclaimed a constitution for a new Confederate States of America, making clear that the new nation was founded on supporting slavery and individual rights for each state. Davis was selected to be the president of the new Confederacy, based on his extensive experience and popular support in the South. On the 18th, Davis delivered his inaugural address on the steps of the Capitol building in Montgomery, Alabama. He spoke of the new Confederacy in revolutionary terms and compared the declaration as akin to those who had revolted against the British in 1776. Davis believed that the South was following in the tradition of the American founding fathers and saw their actions as a return to the correct principles of the past. After he had concluded, Davis went to work in forming and organizing a new cabinet. 
filling the six available positions with one man from every Confederate state bar Mississippi, his own. Davis also understood the importance of international recognition for the Confederacy and sent commissioners to Europe in order to try and establish formal relations as a matter of urgency. It appeared that Great Britain and France would be willing to align with the Confederates. However, hesitancy on the Great Powers' part aided the Confederacy and demonstrations in Liverpool were held in support for the South. Davis also armed the Confederacy and oversaw the formation of the Navy and state militia which would form the basis of the Confederate armed forces and directed a great deal of attention in trying to convince the slave states which had remained a part of the Union to come over to the Confederate side so that their economic, military and political power be augmented. Lincoln attempted the opposite and extended a hand of friendship to slave states, assuring them that the South would not be invaded and that they would be permitted to peacefully coexist with free states in the North. He also warned that the Union would not tolerate seizure or damage to any of its property, a term which was soon to be violated in a move which sparked off the Civil War. Davis and his fellow politicians in Confederacy were irritated and threatened by the presence of a federal outpost, Fort Sumter, which lay on an island at the entrance to the port of Charleston, one of the South's most important landing areas. Davis was informed in April 1861 that a federal naval convoy was headed to the fort and ordered that it be reduced a command which was received by General Pierre Beauregard, who subsequently bombarded the fort from the shoreline. This attack sent shockwaves throughout the continent, and Lincoln declared that it was an act of rebellion against the US government, subsequently ordering 75,000 volunteers to fight against the insurrection. Tennessee, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Virginia all ceded from the Union at this stage and joined the Confederacy with four other states, Delaware, Missouri, Maryland, and Kentucky, remaining in the Union but unofficially contributing many thousands of men to the Southern War effort. In June 1861, the Confederate capital was moved to Richmond, Virginia, to which Davis traveled in the same month, hailed by cheering crowds and salutes. From Virginia and alongside figures such as Robert E. Lee, Davis began to sketch out the war plan for the South. Both he and Lee preferred to fight a defensive war and hoped to take advantage of new weaponry which gave an advantage to troops ensconced in a defensive position. The two men also hoped to deploy the Confederacy's navy and squadrons of privateer vessels against northern ships, wearing it down and eventually leading it to sue for peace. The summer of 1861 saw the first battle of the Civil War after Lincoln had ordered General Irvin McDowell to march on Richmond with his main force. Beauregard was defending the southern capital with a large force assembled at Manassas Junction. Both armies were confident that the war would be a quick one and end in their rivals' defeat. Sightseers from Washington, D.C. came to watch the battle, confident that the North would handily whip Johnny Reb. When the two forces engaged on the 21st of July, a defense was successfully mounted by Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson, who rallied the Confederate troops and won the day, sending the Northern Army reeling back towards Washington. The success animated the South, and led to a belief that the war could be won quickly. Davis lamented that he had not ordered his troops to pursue the attackers back to Washington to launch his own counterattack. Davis soon had to contend with his generals, some of whom were angered that they had not received a promotion, as well as the problems associated with the northern naval blockade of the South, which he hoped to offset with the use of ironclad gunboats which would smash the northern force. In June 1862, 
Lee was given command of the Confederacy's largest force, the Army of North Virginia. Davis remained especially close to Lee, and the two men had an effective and personable partnership. 1861 progressed without further engagement, and the rest of the year was spent planning a spring assault on the North. Meanwhile, the Union planned to attack the South by wearing it down through a combination of naval blockade, the capture of Richmond, which lay close to Washington, and the destruction of Southern arms factories. The spring of 1862 brought mixed fortunes for the South. They had successfully deployed ironclad gunships against the North and had used the CSS Virginia to sink two US vessels. However, the Union had defended the remainder of its blockade force and forced the South to cede control of the important ports of Norfolk, Pensacola, and Jacksonville. General George McClellan, the new Union commander, had launched another massive assault on Virginia from the North, which prompted Davis to expand his own army through the passage of the first ever American conscription law, a move which allowed Stonewall Jackson, Lee, and Joseph Johnston to defend the capital and once again push their attackers away. While the South reveled in the success of its armies in the East, it had, however, lost several of their positions in the West to General Ulysses Grant, including Forts Henry and Donelson, which opened the way for Northern forces to attack Nashville. A furious battle was fought at Shiloh in April 1862, where the South nearly defeated Northern forces before they rallied and forced the Confederacy to back down. This action led to the death of General Johnston, a loss which deeply affected and upset Davis. Facing losses in the West and a stalemate in the East, the Confederacy continued to suffer from economic mismanagement at this time, and high levels of inflation rendered its banks impotent. Davis responded to shortages by printing money, which made the situation worse, and conscription had gutted out the domestic workforce as well as those who were employed to oversee slaves. In the summer of 1862, Lee proposed that his army march north and invade Maryland with an attempt to capture both Baltimore and Washington, a plan to which Davis agreed, believing that such a move could convince Maryland to cede from the Union, but the plan was thwarted when Lee's troops were engaged by McClellan's Army of the Potomac at the Battle of Antietam on the 17th of September and driven back in what was one of the bloodiest battles of the war. The Union victory at Antietam led Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which declared that, as of the 1st of January 1863, the North would consider any enslaved person in the Confederacy to be a free person. This action angered the South beyond measure, but won the North a great deal of international support and further isolated the Confederacy. Furthermore, the Union Army began recruiting all African American units, which further inflamed Southern anger. Jefferson Davis responded by calling for laws to punish captured black soldiers, which resulted in brutal measures that violated the laws of war. In early 1863, the Confederacy defeated another Union attack at Fredericksburg, Virginia. Any beliefs that a swift victory could be enacted against the Union, though many were hopeful as the Southern armies under Robert E. Lee continued to inflict defeats on the Union, Though the situation had worsened in the West, Davis and others believed that one successful knockout victory in the North would bring in outside support from France and Great Britain. Furthermore, Confederate leadership knew that the war had become increasingly unpopular in the North, with many Copperhead Democrats winning positions, thus threatening the war effort. The romanticization of war had run into the hard reality of conflict. Families and communities were decimated as thousands of men never returned from the dozens of battlefields throughout the South and Southwest. 
The Union naval blockade had been very effective, but other aspects of the Northern military had failed to realize significant gains. Still, Davis felt immense pressure from both the outside and internal affairs. In the early half of 1863, Davis had traveled to the front and delivered speeches to soldiers and civilians, many of whom were somber and depressed. He himself had been affected by the war as the Union Army had captured his Mississippi plantation. Davis returned to Richmond feeling wholly encircled. Texas, Arkansas, and Mississippi were directly threatened by Generals Sherman and Burnside of the Union Army, and he knew that the South would lose if the conflict became a war of attrition. Indeed, the President of the Confederacy had also come under fire from his own population, with critics arguing that he was a nepotistic leader who gave positions of command away on the basis of his friendships and not the abilities of the person. That he neglected the Western Front and that he governed without sufficient consultation with his cabinet. The war effort in general had declined in the South with high rates of desertion and the evasion of frontline service from able-bodied men, wealthy families avoiding service by claiming a right to defend their property, and the hoarding of food and wares by many. The farmers and smallholders who formed the basis of the Confederate Army generally did not own any slaves at all, and found themselves fighting for a cause from which they themselves did not benefit, whilst those with slaves avoided service. The southern economy was also in tatters, with the northern blockade suffocating many Confederate industries and conscription preventing many farms from being harvested. Bread riots soon erupted in southern towns, and dissatisfaction with the war and the Confederacy spread. Furthermore, British imports of Egyptian cotton had staved off an industrial collapse in England, thus hurting the South for their strategy to hold off shipping cotton to Europe in order to blackmail European nations to side with them. In May 1863, Lee won a victory over General Hooker and his Army of the Potomac at Chancellorsville. Although the same battle led to the death of the revered General Stonewall Jackson, who was shot by his own troops, undermined the morale boost of this victory. At Vicksburg, Mississippi, the last Confederate position on the Mississippi River, General Grant had laid siege to the city, thus threatening the South's use of the Mississippi. Lee and Davis decided to take aggressive action and attempted to attack Washington itself. Lee attacked Pennsylvania in June 1863 and was soon near Harrisburg, the state capital. On the 1st of July, the Confederate Army came into contact with Union cavalry forces at the town of Gettysburg, under the command of General George Meade, commander of the Army of the Potomac. The initial skirmish between the two sides soon became a large battle which lasted for three days. Lee's attacks on Union positions were repelled with great losses. General George Pickett launched a final suicidal attack on Union positions on the morning of the 3rd of July, which failed, and forced Lee to withdraw, leaving many thousands of bodies behind him. Meanwhile, at Vicksburg on the 4th of July, the Confederate Army surrendered, thus severing the Confederacy in two. Davis referred to the loss at Gettysburg as the darkest hour of our political existence, and settled on the belief that the only way the South could win was if some anti-war faction in the North toppled Lincoln's government before the South was forced to concede. Davis attempted to secure the South's financial position by selling vast sums of cotton, which he had shipped to neutral ports in the West Indies on runner ships that transported cotton out of the South and brought back much needed supplies. General Buxton Bragg in Tennessee had some limited success against the North when he defeated the Union Army at the Battle of Chickamauga. Although he was criticized for not pressing a counterattack, 
and was asked to resign by his general staff, a conflict into which Davis had personally to intervene in order to keep order. Bragg was later defeated at the Battle of Chattanooga in Tennessee, after which he was forced to withdraw his troops, opening the way for the Union into Atlanta. Despite the desperate situation in the South, Davis refused to surrender. He ate and slept very little, and his health declined even further as the war dragged on. In April 1864, his son Joseph was killed after he had fallen from a balcony, and he entered a mood of deep depression. The effect this had on his governance can be seen in the orders he issued around this time. Davis had requested to Lincoln that prisoners be exchanged, to which the Union president disagreed. Davis responded to this by mistreating Union prisoners, packing them into barbarous prisons such as that at Andersonville, a move which only served to further embolden the Northern war effort. In March 1864, Grant was made supreme commander of the Union armies, a rank which had not been held by any other person since Washington himself. And in May, he launched a massive attack on Virginia, whilst Sherman attacked Johnston's forces in Georgia. On both fronts, the Confederate army was outnumbered by two to one, and the South was forced into a punishing defensive action. Johnston was soon pushed back towards Atlanta, and a frustrated Davis replaced him with General John Bell Hood, whom he saw as more aggressive. By autumn of 1864, the Confederacy had been split in three, with Sherman adopting a policy of total war as he set the southern countryside ablaze with his so-called March to the Sea. Davis remained convinced that the South could prevail and did not want to concede without a fight. He attempted to rally his ministers and his population for a final stand, even proposing that slaves be forced into the Confederate army to fight on behalf of the system that enslaved them. However, this order was never carried out. Secret negotiations with the North intensified when Vice President Alexander Stevens met with Lincoln in order to negotiate a truce, though Lincoln declined the offer. On April 2, 1865, Davis and his staff collected their papers and travelled out of Richmond, their remaining troops destroying anything in the city which could be of value to the enemy. He ordered that the Confederate citizens continue the fight Though, to his shock, Davis learned that Lee had chosen to surrender at Appomattox in Northern Virginia on the 9th of April, rather than begin a guerrilla war in the mountains of Virginia. With the situation desperate, Davis headed south to North Carolina and Georgia, attempting to raise armies to strike back at the Union. His generals and Confederate governors all stated that they did not have the troops to do so. Moving westward, Davis believed that he could fight from the west, where a Confederate army under Kirby Smith was still active. As he traveled southward, he learned on the 15th of April that Lincoln had been shot and later killed. While heading west on May the 5th at Washington, George Davis officially dissolved the Confederate government. Only a few days later, as he was crossing Georgia, he ran straight into trouble. On the 10th of May, Davis was captured by Union cavalry officers outside of Irwinville, Georgia, whilst wearing a loose-sleeved cloak and having his head covered with a shawl, leading to the legend that he had been captured dressed in his wife's clothing as a disguise. The Confederacy had been well and truly defeated. Its economy, population, political system and infrastructure lay in ruins, and hundreds of thousands of its men lay dead on battlefields across the North and South. Furthermore, now the Union not only stopped the expansion of slavery, but it also rejected it entirely immediately freeing all those people who remained in slavery 
at the end of the war. The war fought to prevent the North from stopping the spread of slavery had ended with a complete abolition. It was a world turned upside down, and Southern whites were in a state of shock. Davis, once a respected and revered statesman, was now a laughingstock, hated and despised. He was imprisoned by the federal government, he had become the scapegoat for the defeat of the Confederacy, and it was only through the efforts of his wife Varina that he was eventually released on a $100,000 bail. President Andrew Johnson later pardoned Davis of the charges of treason leveled against him and all former officers of the Confederacy. However, even as a free man, Davis felt disconnected from the states he had once governed and was disquieted to see Union soldiers in the state capitals that he had once thought of as a separate country. In 1868, Davis moved his family to London, England, in the hopes of becoming an agent for a cotton importing firm, and was pleased for a short time at the warm welcome he received from members of the British aristocracy and Southern families who had moved there. He soon returned to the US and took up a job as the president of the Carolina Life Insurance Company in Memphis. While there, racist politics had once again become influential in the South, spearheaded by organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan, which briefly served to revive Davis's status in Southern politics. However, he lost it all when, in 1874, the insurance firm Davis headed crashed, leaving him with little financial reserves. After several years of failed business ventures in the South and Europe, Davis moved to the Gulf Coast of Mississippi in 1877 after he was invited by a friend, Sarah Dorsey, to live with her, a move which put some strain on his marriage. In 1878, his son died, soon followed by Dorsey herself, who left Davis her house and much of her estate. Here, he worked on his book, The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, which was criticized for being dry and polemical and quickly fell into obscurity. His reputation after the war did not much improve, although Robert E. Lee defended his friend, stating that he was a talented leader and statesman and that he had kept the Confederacy on its feet during the darkest days of the Civil War. In the final months of his life, Davis was visited by many former Confederate soldiers and citizens who wanted to thank their once leader and who respected him for following the so-called lost cause. In 1886, he took advantage of this revival of popularity and traveled with his daughter on a final tour of the South, where he was loudly cheered and heralded as a hero. In 1889, he developed a bronchial infection and died in New Orleans on the 6th of December, 1889, and was interred first in that city, finally to be moved to Richmond, Virginia. Jefferson Davis is seen both as a hero and a traitor, a man who attempted to found a nation and a man who is a symbol of white supremacy and rebellion against his government he swore an oath to protect. His life was intertwined with the rise of the American Republic as a continental power and he was key in pushing for an American empire of liberty that would encompass all of North America. However, his liberty revolved around a republic that permitted and encouraged the expansion of racialized slavery both to the West and to the South. Davis was an ardent defender of slavery and of the South's right to maintain it, even at the cost of his own health. His leadership of the Confederacy has marked him as a villain of history, though some remember him as a defender of states' rights. Davis was a talented speaker, a keen motivator, and an effective communicator, yet he was willing to fight for slavery to the bitter end, even at the cost of thousands more lives. What do you think of Jefferson Davis? 
Was he a defender of the legacy of the Founding Fathers, or was he a traitor to his country and an advocate of the evil institution of slavery? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.